Good morning, and thank you for being with us this morning for our 50 years of video calling event. I am Patience Whitworth. I serve as Assistant Vice Provost for Operations and Strategic Initiatives at Carnegie Mellon University, and it is my pleasure to welcome Carnegie Mellon University Provost and Chief Academic Officer, James Garrett, Jr. Thank you, Patience. Welcome to our 50 years of video calling event. I'd like to thank everyone joining us on this historic day. I'm also excited to have Mayor Bill Peduto and Alcoa Chairman Mike Morris taking part in this event. Today, we commemorate the launch of the world's first commercial video conferencing service that took place 50 years ago today. The service launched with its first call from Pittsburgh Mayor Peter Flaherty to Alcoa Chairman and CEO John Harper using an AT&T Mod 2 fixture, picture phone. Today, we have their modern day counterparts with us, Bill Peduto and Mike Morris. It is particularly fitting that we're joined by our mayor to commemorate this celebration of Pittsburgh's leadership in launching big innovations. Mayor Peduto is Pittsburgh's number one champion for research and technology development and a passionate advocate for the quest for innovation to expand opportunity for all. Mike Morris serves as chairman of the board of directors of the Alcoa Corporation. Previously, he held positions of increasing responsibility in energy and natural gas businesses. He was the founder of and president of ANR Gathering Company, one of the first gas marketing companies in the United States. Michael is a trustee of the, Michigan, of the Michigan State University College of Law. Bill and Mike, thank you both so much for being here today. Thank you. I'd John. like to recognize one of CMU's esteemed Board of Trustees members, Todd Hunt, who is in attendance today. Todd's great-grandfather, Alfred Hunt, was one of the co-founders of the Pittsburgh Reduction Company, which later became Alcoa. Your family has played in an integral role in the creation of our Hunt Library. And so it is an honor to have you here to witness a part of our institution's history as well as a part of your own family's history. We'd also like to acknowledge another special guest in our audience from the company that made the original 1970 picture phone network possible, AT&T. Joining us today virtually is Mark Blakeman, president of AT&T Mid-Atlantic States, observing the call just as AT&T officials did 50 years ago. As the key player in introducing commercial video call services, AT&T embodied the entrepreneurial approach to technology that Pittsburgh's business and civic leaders eagerly embraced a half century ago and continue to do so today. One of the reasons Pittsburgh was selected as the site of the launch was due to its reputation as a center for technological innovation, much like it is today with pioneering companies such as Alcoa and leading academic institutions like CMU. While the, Pittsburgh, while the pitch, picture phone system never took off commercially, it laid the groundwork for modern day video conferencing applications like Zoom, Google Hangouts, Skype, and FaceTime. The events of the past four months reinforce how essential this technology has become to our everyday lives. And it is these very platforms that have allowed us to teach, learn, connect, and maintain business continuity in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. As part of an initiative to preserve and promote the history of science and technology, Carnegie Mellon's University Library's special collections have two vintage Mod 2 picture phones. I would like to thank Andrew McGee and Shannon Riff from our University Libraries for their leadership in creating today's event. I also want to celebrate that Professor Chris Harrison of the Human Computer Interaction Institute and his lab, who have led a cross-campus team, refurbished the historic phones and updated them with modern components so that they can function today. Later in the program, you'll hear from Chris, Andrew, and our other faculty panelists uh, share more about this project and the enduring legacy of this technology. 
Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Mayor Perduto and Chairman Morris. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Mike, it's great to see you this morning. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I, I would uh, have not have guessed a year ago that this would become such a commonplace way of communicating, uh, but it certainly has. And we have a great shared history between the city of Pittsburgh and Alcoa in creating this mode of communication. That really is true. When you look at the video of 50 years ago, it really was quite a breakthrough. And that technology compared to today's technology is as different as those 50 years are in our everyday life. And to your point, uh, the last year, the last six months anyways, has put all of us in a very different light in using this technology at Alcoa, just as I'm sure you do with your council of mayors and even in some of your own meetings. Uh, this technology allows us to communicate over the five continents where we do business each and every day. And when you think back to the creation of the Pittsburgh Reduction Company and what the Hunt family was able to do, it truly is breakthrough technology in so many ways. But for their creativity, the world wouldn't know aluminum as an element to be used in so many ways to lighten the burden of transportation, air travel, and all of the other things, which, as you know, leads to energy efficiency in so many ways, building structure efficiencies in so many ways. So it's always nice to have one of the hunts with us as well. And I surely know they have been instrumental in Carnegie Mellon's history. I'm sure you're happy to have them with us as well. Well, uh, Todd and his family have been a part of Pittsburgh's fabric for over 150 years. Um, the Hunt family itself uh, has been instrumental in basically creating a city of innovation. Uh, aluminum and the process in order to be able to create it uh, was more about the innovation behind it than the materials in the use of it. And it has set forth uh, the ability to have places like Carnegie Mellon University creating generations of engineers have transformed not only this region, but this world. That really is true. And, and as you know, better than I, Pittsburgh has been a strong base of creativity for many, many industrial activities in the world. We, as you said at the very beginning, we show a film at our annual meetings that we used to have in person, <laughs> our shareholder meetings. We used to show a film that began with the creation of aluminum but then creating the market for the use of the product. I mean, it, it, there was no known use. It's almost as uh, Steve Jobs said years ago, he said, I wanna create a phone that people don't know they need, but ultimately they're gonna want to need and have to have. And of course, that's what we did. And I grew up myself uh, in the energy business and the electric utilities uh, with the battles of Edison and the folks uh, in Pittsburgh, of course, uh, went over how do we how do we actually use electricity how do we create a market for it how do we make it uh, employable for the average citizen to use over the years our major research and development facilities at alcoa incorporated and alcoa corporation are located in the greater pittsburgh area where we continue to make uh, progress and, and innovations uh, so aluminum as it got into competition with uh, with ceramics and other fiber optic and fiber activities for the skins of airplanes uh, as compared to aluminum planes that we're so used to. All of that creativity was right there in the greater Pittsburgh area. So it really has been a foundational state for many, many of America and the world's great innovations and something I know you and your predecessors are uh, dutifully proud of. Yeah, I had the opportunity back uh, around 2008 uh, when I was a council member to travel to Norway and yeah. do a fellowship for one month uh, studying energy policy. And one of the, um, as you're quite well aware, uh, quite a large center of aluminum production based upon the hydropower that has been able to be produced there for uh, such a long time, as well as the natural resources of energy that Norway has. Uh, I, I think Pittsburgh is very similar in, in a sense. You know, yesterday we celebrated the anniversary of the iPhone. I think it's uh, 13 years old. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it's been absolutely transformative. 
you know, the, 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 the ability for everyone now to have this type of a communication is in the palm of our hands. But imagine 50 years ago. I mean, 50 years ago, I, 40, 10 years ago, I'm still tripping over that phone cord in my mom's kitchen. You know, I mean, the idea of actually seeing somebody, the amount of circuitry that would be necessary, the amount of uh, just technology to be able to have that type of a technology that we just assume is natural today uh, with the generation that grew up with this. It really was George Jetson. No, it is. And uh, you'll recall when Maxwell Smart spoke into his shoe, we all laughed. Yep. Or Dick Tracy into his wristwatch. But today, all of those things are real. So for us at Alcoa, we, we just had our annual shareholder meeting virtually. And it's the first time we've ever done that. And this technology allowed our shareholders all across the world to be able to ask questions of Roy Harvey, our day-to-day -day CEO. And it really was a creative uh, utilization. You may recall in the years of Paul O'Neill's leadership of the Alcoa Incorporated uh, Organization, we became one of the world leaders in safety and safety operations. We use this technology today. If we have a safety event anywhere in the world in the continents that we do work uh, on, uh, we share that with all of our uh, fellow workers and associates so that they can understand what happened, what we've learned from it, how we can avoid it going forward. So uh, to our friends from AT&T who were on the call here with us today, uh, God bless you for the creativity and the stick to because as you could see in the original film that I know some people had a chance to view, uh, AT&T took a multi-billion dollar hit when that technology didn't hit the market as fast and as broadly as they hoped that it would. But as frequently is the case for inventors and creators, it takes a while before your creation is truly uh, accepted and understood for the magnitude of what it can and in fact does do. Well, 50 years later, um, as the city of Pittsburgh, we, we, we follow in those footsteps of innovation. And not only that, but we're proud to announce that Zoom is uh, now going to make Pittsburgh uh, its hub for innovation and research on the East Coast. Um, the, the, the path that was laid down 50 years ago today by leaders of Alcoa uh, and by leaders of our research and technology industry uh, continues and they walk within those footsteps. Oh, that really is amazing. Uh, and it just, again, it shows the ability and the functionality of the technology that we have in front of us. Well, in the words of my predecessor, uh, let me make sure I get these right. <laughs> Mayor Pete Flaherty, 50 years ago. It's nice to be with you. And here's looking at you. <laughs> then when I saw that film, I thought how quaint that comment was to uh, call a conclusion to that call at that time. And, and as you'll remember, my predecessor, John Harper, uh, went through a lot of technology advances because he showed us all uh, how to get off of the video, <laughs> to come back on the video. And then to bring one voice uh, back to the screen as well. And, and like uh, Zoom, I know you know that Alcoa Corporation for some years had lost its uh, way and moved its headquarters to New York City. But in April of 2017, we were warmly welcomed to come back home uh, to uh, Pittsburgh. And, and there's our world headquarters as it exists today. And, and as I said, we do business on five of the seven continents. So we clearly are a worldwide organization, proud to be headquartered in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Well, it is truly a gem of the Allegheny wow. and a, a commitment to uh, the early Hunt's family investment into this region, but the continuation of a strong corporate partner and a fabric of all of Western Pennsylvania. And I, I thank you. Well, you bet. It's a uh, it's a joy to be here and have the opportunity to, uh, with such advanced technology from what we had 50 years ago. I, I, you know, we were originally, we were all going to be together at the university, but this probably is every bit as good 
and uh, you didn't have to travel a few blocks to the university and I didn't have to travel a few miles to the university. We were all able to do this in a very convenient way. Yeah, I have to thank Carnegie Mellon, not only Carnegie Mellon, but the folks at the Hunt Library, uh, the, the School of Computer Science. The Hunt Library is amassing a collection of artifacts, uh, not only including these beautiful cameras. I looked at, uh, I had a chance to see one of them yesterday. Uh, not just the, uh, the innovation of technology, but the architectural design of them. I mean, it, it really does look like something of the Pan Am 1960s era. I mean, it, it, uh, and with aluminum based uh, and built. Um, but uh, just the, the, the partnership that Carnegie Mellon has provided uh, to you, to us, uh, to the rebirth of a, of a, of a region uh, that has gone through some very resilient times. It's, uh, they have been our true partner throughout all of this. Yeah, and that is impressive. And uh, we love all of these innovations, the skin on all those cell phones and on these uh, iMacs and things that we're looking at, our aluminum products made proudly by the Alcoans worldwide. And uh, it just shows what the technology can ultimately bring for us. And as I said earlier on, the battle between uh, George Westinghouse and Thomas Edison uh, just, uh, again, introduced uh, creativity uh, to the world uh, in another product that was uh, started right there in Pittsburgh as well. Something to be very proud of, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. And as I said, Mike, nice to be with you. Here's looking at you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Peduto and Mr. Morris. At this time, we did want to take just a couple of minutes, if you are available, to take a few questions from those who have joined us on Zoom, that it, your questions can be submitted in the Q&A box uh, if you are able to see it. But as we're waiting for those to come in, I thought I might kick us off with the first question, which is really related to this kind of time in our history. You both kind of spoke to it as where many of us are working from home or working remotely. Uh, we're using video technology more than ever. And I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about how you're using video conferencing in your own daily routine or in the routine with your teams. Mr. Mayor? Um, I would say that it's just something that I'm doing on a daily basis now. It's, it's become every day a part of my job just as a, a phone conversation or a meeting in this conference room would have been uh, three months ago. Uh, the necessity of having a video uh, conferencing uh, goes beyond just the sharing of documents, which they thought of 50 years ago, which is remarkable, uh, creating a mirror screen in order to be able to share not only this type of conversation, but the document that you were reading off of. And it's, it's encompassed within meetings that are uh, held between my own staff and we're all just a few miles apart. And uh, globally, where uh, we have had uh, video conferences on a weekly basis with uh, colleagues in Asia and Europe and Africa. And uh, being able to do so seamlessly during a time of a pandemic uh, has made the ability of the deliverance of uh, the critical services for the city um, able to continue. Well, that clearly uh, is a great answer when you think through the challenges that we all have had. Uh, for us, uh, again, you mentioned Norway earlier, one of our most efficient facilities is located in Iceland. Our uh, head of operations is headquartered in Europe because of the stretch of Saudi Arabia to North America and from Australia, again, to Iceland. Uh, this technology uh, has been extremely beneficial for us as we continue to do the work that we do. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, we, we spoke about this a little bit earlier, but I'm hoping we can talk about it more about what features of the Pittsburgh business community encourage businesses and entrepreneurs to embrace new and experimental technology like Alcoa did with the picture phone 50 years ago. Well, I think uh, part of that, and uh, I'll leave the, the, the business side of that to Mike, but uh, innovation uh, is profit. I mean, 
the ability to create better, the ability to create more efficient. And as we really come to understand most recently, the ability to create more equitable. Uh, it has a, a bottom line that helps to build out uh, the profitability. Uh, Pittsburgh, you know, is, is often referred to as a city that was built on steel, but it, it was the Bessemer process that really built Pittsburgh. It was the innovation and the production of steel and then steel to aluminum that helped to build the United States and to build the world. And that innovation is in our DNA. Um, as, as we look at institutions like Carnegie Mellon, what we see are they are producing the critical uh, part of the 21st century economy, which is talent. And a city like Pittsburgh that is able to produce that type of talent becomes very attractive to companies, uh, not only to grow within Western Pennsylvania, but to locate here. And that's so true for us as well as we see the opportunities to put aluminum to work in uh, carbon reduction technologies, uh, lightening the load. When you see uh, organizations like Tesla bring an electric vehicle to the marketplace, uh, considerably more aluminum in that production. When you look at the decision that Ford Motor Company made just a few years ago to take the most prolific automobile they've ever created since the Model T, the Ford F-150 truck, and turn a great deal of that body into aluminum. Uh, was quite a decision to be made by Mulally at the time, but it lightened the load, it increased the mileage uh, opportunity for that uh, vehicle without uh, fighting a lot of government standards. So these changes and this creativity, all of which is Pittsburgh-centric, uh, has served the world really, really well. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Morris, thank you both for your time this morning. It has been really great to recreate this moment in history, and we appreciate you joining us. Patience, thank, thank you for uh, making sure we all stayed on cue and stayed on time. Thank you both. Bye-bye. Great. All right, as we move to the next part of our program, I think that we will invite our panelists to join us on screen. And before we move to Q&A for our panelists, I just wanted to do a round of introductions. So I will introduce you and maybe you all could share a little bit about your research um, and yourself. So first we'll start with Professor Chris Harrison, who's an assistant professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon. Yes, thank you. Uh, so in addition to being a computer scientist, my particular area of study is human computer interaction. And that really cares about that intersection between computing and humans and how we can bring things like uh, sensors and artificial intelligence together to enable entirely new ways to communicate, and entirely new ways to harness the incredible potential of computing. And the picture phone is a great example of bringing that human uh, side and the technology side together to en enable entirely new experiences. Thank you, Chris. Next, we'll go to Professor Molly Wright Steenson, who's a Senior Associate Dean for Research in the College of Fine Arts. Good morning. Hi. Um, my research deals with the history of artificial intelligence and computation. So I look at devices like the history, uh, like the video phone, but I also am an interaction designer, which means that I think about how we interact with these different kinds of devices. So 17 years ago, some of my students were looking at mobile video experience, but there just wasn't traction for it yet. And um, now I think we see it very, very differently. Thank you, Professor Steenson. And next, we'll go to Andrew McGee, a postdoctoral fellow in the history of science and computing in the Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. Thank you, and good morning. I'm a historian of technology, culture, business, and markets. I'm interested in the intersection of how technologies are developed and received in societies. The video phone is a perfect example of how technological innovation, cultural change, and societal shifts coalesce into uh, something that takes a long time to develop and be accepted, but eventually becomes a fundamental part of who we are as an American society. By celebrating 50 years of commercial video conferencing, we're making a direct link between a particular moment of time and something that is increasingly commonplace today. 
Thank you. All right, I think it's okay. We, I would invite audience participants to submit any questions they have for our panelists in the Q&A features, and we will get to those as uh, we can in the time of this event. But I think I'll kick it off with the first question, and um, I'm going to go back to you, Professor McGee. What makes historical what makes the historical call we are recreating today significant, and why is it worth commemorating this particular technology moment? Thank you, Patience. We're basically looking at the development of a commercial network. In 1970, when this call is tested out in Pittsburgh on June 30th, and then opens commercially the following day on July 1st, it's really the key moment when video calling moves outside of the lab, it moves outside of exhibition booths at World's Fairs and special events in Washington and New York. And it's the basis of what will hopefully become a commonplace network a viable commercial enterprise where people can telephone from their desks and eventually from their homes and see one another. It's the culmination of decades of research up to that point in the 1970s investigating how to link the promise of seeing one another over a distance with the advancing technology, telephony, electronics, signals processing that would make possible this amalgamation of technological capacity and infrastructure so that people could finally link voice and link video and talk to one another in real time. It's important because it's that direct through line to the moment we live in today. Thank you. Professor Harrison, I wonder if we could continue the conversation we just heard the mayor and Chairperson Morris have related to Pittsburgh. And I wonder if you could speak to why was Pittsburgh chosen as for this first commercial video phone network? And what do you think this says about the past and the present of technology innovation in the city? So the picture phone service was actually supposed to launch in, in two different cities. It was supposed to launch both in Pittsburgh and New York City simultaneously. And that's because both were uh, major hubs for uh, large corporations that would have had the deep pockets to pay for this expensive service. And also they were in a very dense urban core. To carry the signal uh, was actually very expensive, requiring specially upgraded switches and three phone lines for every one call. And because of that, it made a lot of sense to preserve bandwidth on AT&T's network at the time by keeping kind of the customers close and in a compact area, which was true in both New York City and Pittsburgh. Unfortunately, there was uh, kind of they couldn't upgrade the equipment in New York City in time, and that left Pittsburgh as the sole launch city uh, today, 50 years ago. To the to kind of answer the second part of your question about you know, what does this say about Pittsburgh as a technology hub, I, I think a lot of people see Pittsburgh as sort of a recent success story, but I don't think that's actually true. And this is a great example of how that innovation and legacy has gone back more than 50 years, and, and including back to Alcoa you know, in the 1800s. And so Pittsburgh has constantly been a, a site of drawing you know, innovators and entrepreneurs and, and has a continuous history of launching innovations that continues to this day uh, and that we're very proud of. Yes. Thank you, Professor Harris. Well, next I'll go to Professor Steenson. Um, and I, I wonder if you could just comment a little bit about the Mod 2 picture phone as a design object. What may its aesthetics and user functionality tell us about video conferencing tools and methods? Well, I hope you got a chance to see the images and the ads about it because they're it's fantastic. You can think of the Mod 1 with the, the oval and then the Mod 2 with its um, rectangular form, the beautiful stand. Um, there's some lightness to it. It's, uh, it's space age, but it's space age in a kind of 70s way. It's no longer an artifact of sort of the Sputnik design of the 1960s. Um, and it's, I think, really important when we think about the form factor of our technologies, it says something about the period of time that we're in. So. We talked, um, the mayor mentioned the iPhone and it's launched 13 years ago. Um, and we think of what, about what that device looked like. Well, think about what the Mod 2 picture phone looked like and what that meant, um, the small camera, the compact television screen. TV screens weren't compact at that point. Even a, a portable TV was really pretty rare. So we see these different elements of, of screen, of camera, and of just the form of the beautiful device. 
um, that are all that are all characteristic of its time period and the hopes for what it might mean for communication in the future. Okay, thank you. I, I think um, just to uh, continue on that discussion a little bit, I'll ask this question to all three of you, but what can the development of the picture phone, its receptions and its legacy tell us about the potential future uh, for technology and, and maybe even what will video conferencing look like in another 50 years? Andrew, okay. why don't you kick us off? All right. I think the picture phone today is often told as a story of a failure because its Pittsburgh launch did not translate into broader commercial success. But I would argue that instead it's a hidden secret success. It's really a case of laying the groundwork for what would become a commonplace widespread technology. The hundreds of millions of dollars that AT&T poured into it would pay off eventually in broader commercial acceptance of video conferencing. At the time, it was seen as a futuristic technology. It was laden with expectations that no actual technology could meet. This is the kind of connecting across space and time that seems to convey the future, the, the, the world we don't quite live in yet. It's why video conference images were used in Stanley Kubrick's film, 2001, A Space Odyssey. I think we can say that video conferencing in the future will embody our dreams of the present right now, but will actually manifest in a form that we can't fully anticipate. Can I add something to that? Um, I really like that idea that these, what seems like a commercial failure in the moment really is not. And we see that throughout the history of computing, um, particularly that there's kind of a long story about how an idea is created and then many years later we see its success outside of what seems like commercial success. Um, you know, we saw that with the IBM stretch uh, and the way that IBM, that that underscores IBM architectures later on in mainframes. We see that with video as well, with video phone. Um, and we might look ahead and think, well, surely we're going to be in a moment of holograms and holography. And yet that's something that we've been researching for some 40 years already anyway. And so I guess in a sense, what's old is new again and what's new is old. Um, but what makes it come to life is um, connectivity being inexpensive to Chris's point, um, to uh, to miniaturization of chipsets and to screens that over that don't overheat. Those are the beginnings of things that make things possible for a bigger commercial success. I think um, one of the things that I was reflecting over and we saw Chairman Person Morris uh, demonstrate to us is the idea of muting yourself or turning your screen off like mine is right now. Um, but beyond the more common, it doesn't seem like the video conferencing 50 years ago is really a lot different from today. Um, speaking of what you were saying, Molly, why is that? And does it speak to the success of the medium? Why don't you go first, Chris? So, uh, yeah, I think it has largely unchanged. It, it's amazing that, you know, it's been 50 years, half a century. And you know, other than having a color image, the, the end user experience is remarkably similar. I mean, that's a real testament to how advanced it was in 1970. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that is true also for the telephone. I mean, the telephone was invented in the 1870s and yes, you're talking on a small wireless computer now, but again, the end experience is remarkably unchanged. It's still talking with someone by voice. And I think that actually shows that it's very likely that in 50 years from now, I would not be surprised if we still have telephones and video conferencing. They're very good technologies of what they do. That medium is successful. What I think will change is that there'll be new mediums added to that, whether that'll be in virtual or augmented reality or who knows what in 50 years. I'll be hopefully an emeritus you know, professor by then. <laughs> um, but uh, but I, I think that we'll still see video conferencing and telephones because they are so successful and, and so kind of core to the human experience and human communication. I'd add to that that one of the things that we see today, of course, is that they're mobile. You don't need to do a Zoom call from your computer, although I think we're all sitting 
we might well all be sitting in front of computers, right? But we could do this outside in the garden. Um, Mayor Peduto um, could have been out on the river, on the Allegheny. So he could be doing this from a phone and that's the really big change. Chris and Molly are spot on. When AT&T constructed this network in 1970, it was envisioned as a series of desktop units that would reside in the offices of executives of Alcoa and Westinghouse and the great firms of the Golden Triangle of Pittsburgh. And their acceptance would drive the spread of the network as it moved to other businesses and then to schools and then to homes. And eventually everyone would have a unit calling from place to place. As Chris and Molly point out, as new features are laid onto this technology over the past 50 years, what's most striking is that it's detached from this concept of place. No longer are you calling from place to place, you're calling from a number that floats freely. The hardware of the Mod 2 picture phone is now replaced over video calling by software. And you can use it on your phone, on your tablet, on your laptop. You can take it anywhere. And that's really the promise, connecting people regardless of where they are. It just took 50 years to detach that from copper cables. That's right. It's person to person and not what used to be called station to station. Well, speaking of station to station, um, Professor Harrison, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about you and your team's experience of refurbishing the old picture phones held in CMU's collections. What were some of the challenges um, did your lab encounter it to get these working again? Tell us more about that. Yeah, we're, we're very fortunate to have two of the original Mod 2 picture phones that were launching this uh, system. Uh, and we actually don't know how many are left in the world, but it may be you know, only just a few dozen or maybe even less than that. It's very hard to get an accurate count. AT&T has something on the order of you know, six to 10, something on that line. And so uh, we wanted to be very careful when we thought about how we might restore or refurbish these machines to be able to bring them into the present and have them be, you know, help tell the story of video conferencing. And ultimately the decision was made to not try to resurrect the very delicate, you know, 1970s uh, technology and circuit boards uh, in, 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 because we didn't want to endanger uh, the preservation of these devices. And so the decision was made to kind of recreate the devices using the original uh, 1970s enclosure, but sort of augmented uh, with modern technology internals uh, so that we can run things like Zoom and Skype and Google Hangouts and, and have people connect to each other in a way that actually wouldn't be that dissimilar to using a laptop today. And that's how they exist. And we hope uh, in the fall that people can come to Carnegie Mellon's campus and actually uh, connect with someone on one of the original picture phones. That's very exciting. Thank you, Professor Harrison. Professor Steenson, um, just thinking about that technology um, and the picture phone, how does the picture phone figure into popular culture in movies, for instance? It's the future. It's always the future, right? Um, there are picture phones in 1927 in Metropolis. Um, in 1930 or so, there are various ideas for picture phones. Around 1935, I think, is when television is invented. Um, but we think of them, of course, we mentioned 2001, the Space Odyssey, um, the conversation with, um, with his daughter back on Earth. Um, my personal favorite is Colossus, it's a Forbin project, 1970. If you have not seen this, this film, you really do have to see it, um, about supercomputers at war with each other um, between Russia and the US. And there are picture phones on every desk. It's the primary mode of interaction, the interrupt parties, you know, very much the way we would see them now. Um, and we even see it in, in things like Back to the Future 2 in 1989. So we always have it there as a vision of the future. And then we start seeing it again with the emergence of mobile phones that have cameras in them. Around 2004, 2005, it becomes possible to start thinking of video infrastructure for mobile phones, things like mobile video karaoke. Um, so that's the next version of the future. Thank you. I think as we, we stay on this, uh this idea of the future, I want to ask a question that actually comes from our Dean of the Libraries, Keith Webster. So he's going to ask a very uh, Dean of the Libraries question, which I'd love for all three of you to respond to, which is, what should the university libraries be collecting today for celebration 50 years from now? Well, as a proud employee of the university libraries, who has the great pleasure of working with 
the picture phones held by our special collections and with the excellent Trout McCordic collection of vintage information processing and computing and calculating devices, including two Enigma machines that reside in Hunt Library on the CMU campus. I have a vested interest in our uh, continuing to collect interesting pieces that not just embody technological transformation, but typify how people are actually using technology. And we're in a very distinctive historical moment right now. Much as in 1970, when the picture phone was unveiled on Alcoa and mayoral desks in Pittsburgh, the world was in a period of flux. The late 60s, early 70s were a time of great protest and social upheaval and social movement. So too are we in an era when people are seeking to express their voices through technology. And I think one of the things that's driving the peaceful protests across the United States and around the world right now is the ability to capture and share video. So I feel something like a GoPro camera, a phone that is treated as a camera that can transmit images remotely, which is the dream of a picture phone 50 years ago, embodies this ability to organize people for protest, to capture images that can motivate people to hold the powerful accountable and to spread to the media and the broader public exactly what's going on in the world. If you want to embody 2020 in a concept, it's sharing information. And that information right now means video that's captured on mobile portable devices. That's what I put in the libraries. I can quickly jump in. I think the, uh what we need to collect is a better outreach actually into Pittsburgh and the community. There's so many amazing artifacts out there. And I think, uh, you know, universities tend to be quite myopic in what they kind of collect, you know, you professors notes and things like that, but there's such a treasure trove of amazing technological advances that, uh, you know, end up being put into some storage closet and forgot about. And, and, and we should be the stewards of that history. So I think it's actually quite broad ranging and, and we have an important role to play along with other partners, you know, obviously uh, the city itself, but you know, the University of Pittsburgh and the other great institutions that are here. I'd add to it, thinking of the media that's likely to be dead media. Um, if we look back over the last 25, 30 years, a lot of our video cassettes have gone missing and dead. Our compact discs have been destroyed. And yet those are the kind of ephemeral ways that we've captured the projects and, and the ideas that we've had, the everydayness of what we do. And so I would, um, I would say that the university, especially where it's thinking about these communication advances and how they bring people together are concerned, should find ways to capture those projects of the everyday right now, both in the larger data stores that um, it might have through something like um, Library of Congress and Twitter on one hand, but um, working across the campus to make sure that the everyday projects, whether it's 15, 112 in the School of Computer Science or the School of Designs, Interaction Design, Masters projects, that we capture those and make sure that people can understand what they are and what, what ideas they were performing. Great. Well, thank you all. I hope that um, that was the answer that Keith wanted as well, but the very thoughtful <laughs> response from you all. Um, and I appreciate your participation on this panel. And I want to thank everyone who joined us today for as we mark the 50 years of video calling. And I especially want to thank the three of you on the panel. I know um, Andrew uh, and Chris and Shannon, not pictured now, uh, have put an enormous amount of time into this event. So I just wanna thank you both, uh, all three of you for your leadership. And of course, we are grateful for the participation of Mayor Perduto, Chairperson Morris, Provost Garrett, um, and you, Professor Steenson. So I think we will conclude the event at this time, but thank you all very much for joining us and for uh, recreating this important time in our history. <laughs>